Hey, everybody. If just one or two people could type in um, that you can hear me fine, my mic's great. That would be fantastic. Um, my name is Andrew Kraus. I co-founded EventRight with Stephen Key over 20 years ago. And we've been coaching and mentoring inventors for the last 20 years. We've had students in over 65 countries. And what we focus on is licensing, which is selling. It's not selling. I don't like to use it. Some of you guys have a question on this already. You're not selling your idea to a company. You're renting or you're leasing it. And then they pay a royalty for every unit that they sell. And that's what licensing is. And so if they don't perform, you can take it back. Um, today, I'm, I decided to wear my headset. Hopefully, I give you guys better, slightly better sound. I look a little bit geeky, but you get better sound, so that's what you guys care about, right? How getting good, good answers and having good sound, so I thought I'd try the headset again today. Um, okay, so let's get started. We got a whole bunch of questions in here. People are starting to flow in. Uh, type your questions into the chat. Uh, I can't always get to to all of them. Somebody suggested, I forget who it was, that I think it was in the comments of one of the YouTube uh, live shows after the fact that I should copy all the questions and then answer those questions first the next time. And I don't know if that makes sense. I'd rather answer the questions for the people that are on and listening right then. Um, maybe it's because that person didn't get their question answered. I, I can possibly answer them all, but I'll try to answer as many as I can. Um, the price is right. I'm doing it for free. Uh, we started doing this uh, during COVID, and people seem to really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, you guys are really appreciating it, so I, I'm really enjoying doing it. And you guys have incredible questions. And like I always say, I'm a little bit tired, so sorry if I, if I look tired and I look geeky. Who cares, right? As long as Andrew has good question answers. Um, but you guys have really good questions. Inventing for most of you, unless you came to it just recently, is part of who you are, you know. And if I can help you become the inventors that you want to be by guiding you on the business side of things, it makes me feel really good. Um, when Steve and I started InventRight 20 years ago, I was running an inventor association, in Silicon Valley, and I was doing it just because I loved it. Um, not to make money. I was volunteering my time. I was the president of the group. And um, Stephen saw that. He saw how passionate I was about it. And we realized there really wasn't something that really guided people the way they needed to be guided, that people were not having success just with information, that they needed uh, more guidance. And so we started InventRight out of a passion for helping people. It was never like, let's start a business so we can make money off of people. That was never ever the case and but now it is a business i do have uh, 22 people that i i manage and i'm very proud of that and we support their families and we support all our inventors um, but anyway long enough uh ramble on that um let's get started uh, uh java says hi andrew my idea is a packaging design not the packaging machine but i found a packaging company that makes the packaging machines for multiple food companies it's a little, probably a little confusing, you guys. I've done packaging products, so not so much for me. But So he's got a packaging design. It sounds like it's for food companies. And he found a packaging company that makes the machines. So you've got a couple players here. You have the company that's making the packaging that the food is going in. You have the company that's making the machine that packages it. And then you have the actual packaging company that packages it. They use the machine they bought from the machine manufacturer to then package the food for the company that makes the food and sells the food. Okay, so his product has to do with that package, I guess. I am not sure how to get royalties if I license my idea to the packaging company. Um, well, the company you're talking to is the, the machine company. So it's really simple. You get a royalty on every time a unit was sold. So if the packaging company um, use this package for 5, 10, 15, 20 different companies, every time they sold a unit, you could get a royalty. And it could be paid from the company doing the packaging for the food company. You could work it out where you're getting it from the food company. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. You could license it to the packaging company, and then they could sub-license it out to the food company. It's not complicated. That's It's more complicated than a regular deal, but that's the, the gist of it. So hopefully that's helpful. 
Um, uh, Saeed, I've designed a product, but not sure about the details of its manufacturing process. I know the manufacturing process is knowing the manufacturing process necessary. Should it be included in the PPA? Most of the time, our students or InventRight students don't understand exactly how something is manufactured. Huge percentage of the time, and it's really not a problem most of the time. Could be. It depends on the product. You know, I don't know your product. You're not going to disclose it here on the live YouTube show. But, um, you know, if you can see things that are somewhat similar and it verifies that you know it can be done and you can even look at the pricing for those similar things to figure out if it can be done. Um, so you can make assumptions. But no, you don't have to put the method of manufacturing in your patent. Now, if you did know it, that can be great a great thing to protect in addition um, to, it could almost be a separate patent, but you could put it in the same patent as well. It's called a, met, there's no, it's what people refer to it as, but it's a method of manufacturing patent. Um, it's actually just a utility patent. There's just that type of patent for that sort of thing. But you could refer, some people refer to it as a method of manufacturing patent. How is this thing made? Sometimes you can't protect the idea, this is occasionally, but you could protect the method of it manufacturing. It rolls off the machine, then it goes here, then it sticks the label here, but it gets awfully involved to understand how that manufacturing equipment works. And most inventors don't understand it, and it's rare that it's a problem for our students if they don't understand it. But without knowing your specific invention, Saeed, I couldn't, um, couldn't say for sure what applies to you. Um, uh, Perm says, oh, and by the way, when you type your questions, if you have some sort of handle that's not your name or your first name, just type your first name at the beginning of the question so I'm not addressing people by weird handles. Um, I hope everyone's doing well with your ideas and inventions. Yeah, great, Perm, that's great. Um, thank you for wishing everybody well. Um, uh, another weird handle, Rain Flake. Uh, hi, Andrew, how about we, we've got this the last two sessions, I think. How about selling my patent as opposed to licensing? No, 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 and no. Um, the only time it makes sense is when you have a company, you have inventory, you have distribution, you have tooling, you're all set. Then you can sell your company in addition to getting a licensing deal and royalties. But it doesn't matter how big they are, trying to sell your patents or your product outright is just stupid. You'll never get the amount of money as you would if they pay you over time. And it did, people are like, "Oh, but this is a really big company." Yeah, but they don't know. They don't know for sure themselves if your product's going to be successful. So that's too big of a risk for them to take. Um, you wrote, "If my invention functions, the non-retail invention would be revolutionary." And by the way, never use the word revolutionary. You can use it with me. This is a safe space. You can use it in our group here, but never state that to a company. It's a green rookie inventor move. Revolutionary, nothing like it. Never, ever use those words. Um, you said it'll be revolutionary. I'll be able to get a life settling amount. Uh, again, terrible words to use for the patent. So um, I, that's probably, you know, here's this. And so I don't know what your invention is, Rain Flake, but you might be right. It might be this God crazy invention that earns millions and millions of dollars a year. I don't know. But most inventions aren't going aren't gonna to earn that kind of money. Um, you know, you, they might earn you 20K a year, might earn you 50, it might earn you 200K a year. But let's say, let's say you're earning 200K a year and it sells for five years. That's a million dollars. But this whole thing that you're going to earn a million dollars overnight, like in two seconds, or they're going to give it to you up front, is just crap. It just is. And so if you guys are, are doing it just for the money, um, I found that it's a total cliche, but you do what you love, the money will come. Um, and I found that to be true. Now, I, I have no problem with people being motivated by money, but if you really enjoy inventing and, and reaching out to people and all that, um, then you, you, you will be successful. You might license your first, it might be your second or third or fourth. Um, and... If you haven't blown a bunch of money on a patent, you'll always be able to move on to your second or third or fourth. That's why we highly advise people file provisional patents. I know a lot of you have filed patents. That's fine. Next time, don't do that. There's absolutely no reason to do it. The reason why people do it is they, they want to get the warm and fuzzies there protected. But if you file a provisional the day before you're ready to start calling, you get a whole year 
see if there's interest. And if you know how and you start contacting companies the day after you file it, you'll never need more than a year, except with some really rare products. But a lot of people file patents that want to be protected and they don't start calling companies because they don't know how, they don't feel empowered. So hopefully today's show and our channel and if later you wanted to sign up for a coaching program, hopefully those things will make you feel empowered enough so you're not just running out filing patents and making prototypes and not contacting companies. Um, but Rainflake, um, don't try to sell it outright. Wrong thing to do. You will fail if you do that. Um, guaranteed. Don't even bring it up. I've, I've talked about this, I think, in the last two sessions. So sorry for talking so much on that. Um, Bradley's saying a few things. I can't talk about other companies, Bradley. We, I'm very careful about that. Uh, I never want to say statements, good, bad, about another company, get sued for that sort of thing. I just, so I never comment on that. Um, uh, let's see. Henrietta, I have a practical beauty cosmetic makeup accessory with three variations. It, is it difficult to license this market? No, it's, it's, it's a fantastic uh, category. And that has changed. Steve and I have been doing coaching people and guiding people to license their products for 20 years. And it used to be like the, a few major makeup companies that dominated the category. But um, as of the last, I, I'm not going to quote how many years, I would say maybe five, six years, maybe more, but at least five, six years, I think. Um, all these smaller um, makeup companies uh, started just popping up all over the place servicing thing, servicing um, women um, that weren't getting what they needed from the major cosmetic companies and serving different niches and things. And so um, our students have had great success reaching out to cosmetic companies. There's a lot more out there when if there's like if there's only three, like, for instance, in razors, there used to be three companies. That was it. And somebody had a razor. I'd be like, uh, no, I don't I don't know. That's going to be hard. And um, and then other razor companies started coming out too. And I'm like, oh no, you got a nice selection of potential licensees. But um, and the makeup market is the same. It's changed. And so great, great market. I love it. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's a it's a tough a bad market to get into at all. Um, Jeff says there are several companies that are not responding to multiple contact attempts. Let me move this up here. Uh, LinkedIn email, phone call. Yeah, that's normal. I mean, if you have 30 companies for a percentage of them to be hard to reach, very normal. Um, do you recommend written correspondence? You mean like a letter? No, I, I'd say that's a pretty much a waste of time these days. Yeah, send a fax. You know, we've been doing this so long. There was a time where we said, send a fax and get their attention. They're not used to getting a fax. 20 years ago, we were saying that. Not anymore. Um, if so, sell sheet in the initial letter, question mark. No, you kind of want to ask permission. Um, you need to reach out to different people on LinkedIn is what I would do, different people within the company. Um, also, my guess is your approach on LinkedIn is probably not right. You never want to send a request when you, you just request to add them to your network, but you don't put anything, any writing or any request for help or what you want, just add them to your network. You should also take another look at your LinkedIn profile. If it's not professional, they may be taking a look at that going, mm, I don't want to add this guy to my network. Like me, I add anybody to my network. I have about 10,000 contacts um, because Stephen, I've been doing this forever. And uh, but the only thing I look for is, are they an invention scam company? Because I hate those guys. And so I just like looking to see if they're one of those. And then I just deny those. But anybody else I let in. Not everybody's like that. So they might check out your profile. So you're doing something wrong, Jeff. Um, but maybe not that much, because if you're reaching out to 30 companies and there's four you're having a hard time getting a hold of, pretty normal. I mean, if I don't know what percentage hit rate you're getting on how many, why don't, why don't you type that in and later when I get down further, type in, I called this many companies and I got into this many. And then how many times you contacted some of these two. I, I think that'd be great for other people to hear to kind of set the bar a little bit. Um, Gary Von Gary says, how much more is a patent worth once it's received a patent pending than a patent issued status as opposed to just having having just filed one, can you get a higher royalty rate once it's pending than issued? 
some companies could care less if you have a patent at all. Some companies, they kind of like that. You know, if you think about it, it's, it's kind of better in some ways, again, looking at all the angles, if it's not issued yet, if it's still pending, because then, you know, it's, it's up in the air as to what claims you're going to get. And if that they were one of very few companies that wanted to work around you, they wouldn't know what claims you're going to get. And it wouldn't be um, as attracted to work around you because it'd be uncertain. So in some ways, uh, having an issued patent is worse. Now, if having a really strong issued patent, um, there could be a benefit to that. And there are some companies that really care about that. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, they're not going to give you any more if the patent is issued. And it's utterly ludicrous to wait for a patent issue to start to try to license it. And if that's your thought, which you didn't say that was your thought, don't ever have that thought. That's just stupid. Because yeah, I should stop using these words, ludicrous, stupid. I just can't try to get your guys' attention, I guess. I'll stop doing that. But um, so, uh, you know, it's you, you don't want to wait the two to three years and occasionally a year that it takes for a patent to get issued before you reach out to company. The product might not make sense anymore at that point. Something else may have come out, you know, and it's very common that that could happen so that's just not smart to do that oh i did it again i said not smart okay i'll try not to do that um so in some cases it could be the case you know there are certain industries that are really obsessed with intellectual property and patents like uh medical device industry if you have new medical devices not something simple like a new scalpel but some sort of new medical device there's certain industries that are patent picky I just came up with that name, um, and that might that might make a difference. But I think in most cases, it's not going to make a difference. Um, but it could. So uh, every company is different. Uh, Susie says, is there one place to get a list of companies to contact in a particular arena, for example, pet? No, nobody's going to give you a list. You have to figure out the list that's right for your product. So you have to look for companies that are selling in major retailers kind of in that product category. It's not, it's not complex. Everybody thinks that's rocket science. You need to learn how to make a list. And so when, when our students come on board with us, the coach will say, oh, well, based on your product, I'd look here, I'd look there. And the student is making the list. The coach isn't going, here's your list. You know, oh, I've got a list of uh, 100 pet companies and these 20 are right from you. Here you go. You're not going to learn anything that way. So I was going to say, that's crap, but I'm not going to say that because I'm not I'm supposed to say that, right? But that thinking is wrong. You need to know how to make your list for companies that are right match for that particular product. So let's say, Susie, you know, long term, if you love pet and you stay in pet, um, one of the things that I talk about often in these Q&As is when you present a product to a company and they turn you down, you didn't waste your time. You made a relationship. Sending them that first product was your opportunity to make that relationship. And so when they say no, then you say, oh, can I, can I send you more in the future? And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, and so let's say you did that, Susie, and you had 40 companies that you'd contact in the past with other products. You would still want to look at each one of their product lines currently to see which companies out of those 40 that you know, maybe 15 are right for this new product. You want to be respectful. They don't want to continue to see product ideas from you if if you're sending stuff that's not even re remotely a right match for them, you know, that's irritating. And um, my business partner, Stephen Key, we, he wrote the book, Become a Professional Inventor, the new book that we got out. And in that book, a large percentage of companies says 80% of the submissions is like, did they even look at our product line? Did they go to our website? Because this isn't remotely or too far off from what we would do. And so you need to take the time to do that. So no, Susie, you don't look for a list. Make your list. Um, but great question. These are all great questions. Um, Brandon, number one question, which companies follow US patent laws? I don't know what that means. What you're really saying is which companies would rip you off? I don't really know what that means. Um, you know, in, in the 20 years Steve and I have been doing InventRight with students in 65 countries, I don't know of one of our students that had spoken to a potential licensee, a company they want to license to, and um, the company stole their idea. I don't know of one yet. 
maybe a student that, you know, we train and they've gone out there and then it happened to them. But, and I think the main reason is our students act professionally. Now I talk to, so that is the best form of protection. So for that three or 4% of companies that might mess with you, I, that's not exact percentage guys. That's my guesstimate. Um, they see, you know what you're doing. They don't mess with you, but they might mess with that wacky inventor that doesn't know what they're doing. You know? Um, so I think conducting yourself professionally is actually better protection than a patent. The way you send emails, your presentation, everything, you know, and in the rare case, you're getting a weird vibe from them. We teach our students to send certain messages that don't sound paranoid at all, but put them on, give them some doubt about additional intellectual property you fought, property you filed or something else. So they're like guessing and then they don't um, do the idea. I've had plenty of students that were worried about that. Um, I gave them some things to say to the company, not being the paranoid inventor. I'm, I know you're going to take my idea. They're not saying things like that. And they tracked the company's website afterwards. I've never had one come back and say, Andrew, they ended up taking it. You know, now I've talked to inventors where companies have taken their idea. And in some cases, um, the company didn't. And the vast majority of them, like, I think I've talked about this in other Q&As where the inventor, I said, well, okay, they stole your idea, but how long ago do you show it to them? And they're like three weeks ago, and now I see it on the market. I'm like, there's no company on the face of the planet that can launch a product in three weeks. And I mean, I'm sorry, any inventor that thinks that is whacked and doesn't have any sense of um, logic. I mean, I don't, I don't, hopefully there's none of you guys would ever think that that's the case. Um, but I've talked to a few other inventors where it's happened and, you know, they asked for, who was it before that was asking for money up front? Um, Rainflake, yeah, was asking that. And so they'll, they'll ask for a quarter million up front, 100,000 up front. And, you know, after the companies got wrapped up in their project and they started moving forward and stuff, and the company's like, you know, screw you, and that we're going to go do our own thing and they figure out a way around it. Um, but if the inventor hadn't asked for crazy stuff, and hadn't conduct themselves unprofessionally that I don't think it would have happened. It's not a justification that it's okay to do that, but I think treating um, the marketing managers and acting professionally from day one is an incredible form of protection that no patent attorney ever talks about because patent attorneys don't know how to approach companies or license anything. Um, and they shouldn't be insulted by that. That's not their job. Um, Paulo says, hello from Los Angeles. Hello, Paul, Pablo. Um, uh, invent factor. Hi, Andrew, Jamie here. We have interest in one of our products from a family of products. Okay. What should we look for when they say we can do it? We can, we can add it to a kit or use it as, at a, as a promotional item. You know, that's a, it's a tough question. I'd need to know what the product is. Um, that sounds great. The fact that the great thing is they're asking about what, what we want to do this with it. So what you should say is, great, you know, um, here are my ideas for making it a kit or it being a promotional item, if that's what they want to do. Where do you want to place it? What do you want to do? You need to adjust. A big part of inventing is adjusting to their comments, maybe even changing the product, God forbid. You know, but change, change the product if you need to. Change how they want to do it and have those discussions. So just talk to them about it. And if you haven't gotten on the phone and talked to them about it, do not do that all via email. Please get on the phone. Um, uh, uh, reckless. Uh, hey, Andrew, how can you spot those copycats that turn around and try to copy your invention? Uh, I don't know who those are. I haven't experienced that at InventRight in the last 20 years. Are there companies that will copy other companies' products? Yes, but how is that a problem for you? You, you wanna license your product to a big company and if that big company is selling 80% of the product and the other, and some other companies are knocking them off and they're selling 20% of the product, congratulations, you're successful. So you can't avoid copycats in a lot of cases. Um, you know, I was just talking to on our free webinar tomorrow night, it's free for the public. So you guys, if you're not event rights students, which most of you aren't, um, we have um, 
Jason coming on from Fred and Friends. And they have really cool um, uh, functional novelty products. They're like kitchen gadgets and they're fun or funny, but they're still functional. And, um, and, and uh, you know, he was talking about the problem in that area of getting knocked off and they've gotten knocked off, but people recognize the difference between the knockoffs and the originals. And, and yeah, some people buy the knockoffs and your company that you license to, if they're selling 80% because it's popular, 20% are knocking off, they might bother to send cease and desist letters and stuff. And they might stop some of them might not stop all of them, but you know, this perception that you get a patent, you can protect, protect it all around the world and nobody's going to do anything similar that's that's just not true even if you're a giant company um but you know and it's fine you know it, it's just fine and get used to it and if you can't and if you still think because your patent attorney told you you know that you can just beat everybody over your head with your patent they're, they're they're wrong um let's see i lost track here what um Rick says, I keep getting this question. Do you have enough confidence in a company to not need to file a provisional patent? Um, I, what we do, what we advise all our students to do in my legal disclaimer is to always file a provisional patent, okay? Um, but I've known inventors that, you know, once you, if you're just gonna show it to one or two companies you already know first um, and you know them and you've submitted them other products and you have a good relationship with them, I think you could do that. I'm not telling you to do that, Officially, I'm saying seek the services of an attorney, but you could do that. But, you know, kind of why? A provisional is $70. Why wouldn't you file it? Um, but if you're very prolific inventor, Rick, I could see scenarios with companies you already know or you, you could do that. I'm not advising you to do that, but you could do that. Um, and sometimes people work are very prolific. And yeah, if you, if you did 10 products in a month, and 10 times 70, that's 700 bucks. You know, it's more about the time it takes you to write it. So if you're very, very prolific, I could see it making sense in certain categories. Um, Brandon says, some companies in the U.S. are Chinese. Yeah, some companies, not many still. I'm seeing a lot more selling on Amazon, but they're not companies with brands so much. They're just schlock and whatever and quite often knocking off something else and making it cheap or what have you. Um, but there are legitimate Chinese companies in the U S I think I've mentioned this on some of the other um, live streams. We had a, a student of ours licensed to a Chinese Israeli guy he licensed to a Chinese toilet company that was already had distribution of their toilets in Walmart. Fine. They have, if so the, the litmus test is if, you're not going to call a Chinese company and license to them. But if they are have distribution in the U.S., there's no difference between them and a U.S. company because they have distribution in the U.S., in the stores. But, you know, historically, you know, Chinese manufacturers were contract manufacturers. They manufacture for U.S. companies, you know, and you license the U.S. company. But you're starting to see more and more. Again, I had a, a French Canadian and he was living in the Yukon. It's a lot of geography here, huh? And uh, he licensed to a Chinese company that did camping products. And very odd, he licensed a whole line of camping products. They're like, what else do you have? What else do you have? What else do you have? I was a little concerned at first. And then like, we want to license it all. And they did. And he had no problems with that. Um, but you're not going to like look, go to Alibaba and look up contract manufacturers. You license to companies that have distribution in the stores you want to be in, not then can just make it. Okay. That's the, the, the test. You don't just want somebody, oh, we have a manufacturing facility. Well, where do you have distribution? And they're like, uh, but if it was just, let's say it's the toilet company and they're like, oh, no, we got product at Home Depot and Lowe's and Walmart. It's like, okay, great. You know, then, but, and you are going to see more because I think the Chinese companies, they, they don't understand the culture. They don't understand the market. It seems to be changing. Um, but, you know, with, with things that are going on in the environment these days, you know some more things are going to be made in the U.S. and some less things are going to be made in China. Um, when 90% of masks are made in China um, and a lot of other medical things, that's a problem. That's a real problem uh, for 
for our sovereignty and our well-being and, and all that. And so some of the things are going to change. Um, and a lot of manufacturing has been shifting to Vietnam and other places as well. But I think Vietnam is, it's not as big of a country though, um, is in some ways the, the new China with, you know, a lot of manufacturing being done there. But I think they have their limitations. I'm not an expert in that, but um, that's one of the things I've noticed. Um, Mikhail, uh, hi, Andrew, if I'm only making design changes and not utility changes to an existing product, do I still have to apply for a PPA before I share my sell sheet? Um, yeah, well, design changes. So, you know, a, a utility patent is the way something functions. It has new utility and functions. It's hinge and it does this and you have to claim some sort of functionality or utility. Um, but with a design, if your design doesn't create any new functionality or utility now, then, then you can't typically get a uh, utility patent on it. It would be design patent, but there is no provisional design patent, unfortunately. And it's going to cost you a hell of a lot more than 70 bucks, probably at least 1500. Um, and it has to be unlike a provisional, which you can write in common English. Any of you can do that with a design patent. The drawing needs to be just a certain way. And you have to have a professional patent drafter do that. And that's a lot of money to spend. And I don't find that that's necessary. Now, there is nothing holding you back and no patent attorney will tell you this, but legally it's perfectly sound. Um, you can file a provisional patent full well knowing it doesn't have any functionality or utility and still legally say patent pending. So you can, you can put whatever you want in there and you might guess as, oh, well, maybe I can get something on this and you can legally say patent pending. So for 70 bucks, Gary, uh, is it Gary that, was, now I lost track of who, Mikhail, sorry, Mikhail, um, you can still legally say patent pending. And um, so even if it's just design changes, you can claim some sort of functionality. It might be a stretch, but legally you can do that and then you can say patent pending on it. It puts everybody on notice, just perceived protection. So that's what I would do in that case, in most cases. Again, not legal advice. Seek the, site, the services of an attorney if you need legal advice. Um, uh, okay, so Gary Von Gary says, how much more value towards your invention does a PCT have? What is the best way to maximize your output after investing in a PCT? Well, the best way is to never file a PCT to begin with. Um, so a PCT is something that you can do. It's called a patent cooperation treaty. And what you can do is you can file a provisional patent application. And then within that year, you can file a PCT, which preserves your foreign filing rights. And it gives you another 18 months. And then you can file internationally and, and, and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on patents internationally if you want to. But here's the here's the point that I'm trying to make, Gary. It's not directly ask, answer your question, is if you file your provisional patents the day before you start reaching out to companies, you will never need it more than a year to see if there's interest. And if there is interest, get the company to pay for the PCT if necessary, and then file internationally if they want to file internationally. So that's the best way to approach it. Um, but you asked, what's the best way to maximize your output after investing in a PCT? Well, now it's too late. So you filed patents, provisional, filed a PCT. You're wanting to file around the world. Um, uh, you know, it, it gets very, very freaking expensive. So I would work double time to try to get a licensee because it's going to get insanely hundreds of thousands of dollars expensive once you start filing internationally for the most part, depending on where you file. So, um, uh, you know, but you're already in that situation. So um, license it as fast as you can before you have to start filing internationally because the PCT gives you 18 months to file internationally. So it's giving you another 18 months. So, so try to get a licensing deal on the table during that time and then get them to pay for the patents. Um, so that's what I that's what I would say. Um, let me go to some ones that people I didn't. Okay, uh, didn't answer. Let's see. Uh,
Okay, Perm says, Wayne here is, is it a sure thing a PPA will get approved? Yes. So 100% of PPAs, they don't even look at it. The only reason why a PPA wouldn't get approved is if you didn't fill it out right. You didn't put your address, you didn't pay the fee. Um, what you put in the PPA, you could scribble on it with crayon and they would accept it, okay? Um, so there is no mistake to make there except for not filling out the forms correctly, not what you submit as your PPA. Um, how long does a PPA approval take? How will you get notified it's been approved? Almost everybody I know of these days files electronically. So, you know, you, you get back in a couple hours, a day to at most a, a, a notification that it's been accepted and you're good. And you, you can legally say patent pending, which is really cool. You don't have to say provisional patent pending. You can say patent pending, which is cool. So for those of you that are new, you thought you might like that. Um, Jay says, if you filed a non-provisional on a technology idea of animated, have an animated explainer video, is it okay to have the video show the full features? And if so, should it only be shown after they sign an NDA? Okay. Is it okay to have the video show the full features? Um, why not? Okay. All right, so what, what he's kind of asking is, uh, uh, should I hide some part of my invention so they can't figure it out and knock me off? And my answer is, show them whatever is required to sell the product. So never hold back on understanding of the invention. It's like, this looks interesting, but I'm a little confused. You don't want them to, you don't want them to react that way. You want them to feel like, Oh, yeah, I get it. If my customers saw this, they would want to buy it. So don't hold back on anything that helps them understand the product. Now, if there's complex inner workings of it, you know, if you were showing that video to a consumer, you wouldn't get them all wrapped up in that anyway. So that's fine to, to hide that, you know. Um, so always show whatever you need to. And the answer is it's not about NDAs. It's about PPAs. You want to file a provisional patent application. And if you ask every company you approach to sign an NDA, many won't. They will sign, they will be happy with you signing theirs, but most won't sign yours up front. And you probably got some advice from an attorney there. But again, don't do anything without getting advice from an attorney. Um, you know, this perception that all these companies need to sign some messed up NDA that your attorney gave you that's going to freak them out. Um, is advice from an attorney. Um, so, you know, a lot of times they'll, you know, they'll want you to sign their NDA. And you think about it. Let's say they get, let's say they get a fair amount of ideas, they get 100 ideas a month. So they're okay with their NDA because they read it. Their attorney did it. But let's say all 100 inventors had a different NDA and they need an attorney on there like almost full time to read every inventor's NDA to make sure that you didn't write in there that, that you own their company or something crazy like that. It's not practical for them to review every NDA. Now, am I saying that you should never send a company an NDA? Absolutely not. You know, they've seen the product, they know what it is, and now they want the inner workings of it or a prototype or something else, and then it may, might make sense to get them to sign an NDA after you talk to them. And you're probably like, well, that's ass backwards, Andrew. Don't you want them to get them to sign a non-disclosure agreement before you show them anything? And ideally, yes, but it's not practical with most companies in most situations. You're either signing theirs or you do nothing. And your PPA, your provisional patent application shows what you, you're, you're protecting. And see, they don't know what you're protecting or not. So, cause they can't see your provisional. So that's great. And so one of the earlier questions were, um, is it stronger to have a patent, an issued patent? Well, in some ways not, because they can look at it and go, oh, this is weak. We can get around it here, here, and here if it was one of these unscrupulous companies. Of course, I know I mentioned that's very uncommon, but it could happen. But if it's a PPA, then they can't see it. They have no idea what you protected. Now they got to call you back. They got to communicate with you. And now you got a fish on the hook. So um, most of our students are perfectly happy filing provisional patent applications, but Jay, you need to consult with your attorney on what to do that, do there. And you will feel like you're beating your head up against a brick wall if you insist every company sign your NDA. Um, again, you know, when you, 
with the American Vents Act, you know, it's first true inventor to file. So if you filed a provisional patent and then you sent them your idea and then they came out with it, you know, or they filed, wanted to file something on their own, they're not the first true inventor. And you have the emails and everything you sent to prove that you're the first true inventor of that product. But again, these are the types of things that people ask all the time. And like I said, in 20 years, I don't personally know of an inventor, student of ours, that is presented to a company and then the company knocked them off. Um, we've had some close calls, but it hasn't happened to the best of my knowledge. Um, but it does happen to some inventors out there. But I think people are afraid of our students because they're like, this person has their shit together. Pardon my language. Um, I said it to get your attention. And I don't want to mess with them. I might mess with that crazy guy from a couple months ago, but we're not going to mess with this guy. We're either going to license it or move on. So conducting yourself professionally is the best form of protection over NDAs, patents, anything else. Um, I like saying that stuff because it's you guys aren't thinking it, and it's it's true. Um, Veronica, my idea is unique and novel, but very simple. I worry maybe too simple, but it took me a very long time to get it streamlined and elegant. Do you find licensors respect the effort it takes? Yes, I do find they do. Um, well, not all of them do. I mean, a lot of them are like, yeah, I don't know. Eh, it's not interested in that. And, but you just need one out of a bunch of companies you approach Veronica. So, um, you know, not, not all... And the marketing manager may see your project number two later and they're like, oh, that's cool. So I don't know what you mean by respect, but yeah, I, I, don't, I wouldn't worry that your product is too simple ever. If you feel like it would intrigue a consumer to buy it and if you have the right marketing piece, it, they would show interest and the, the marketing manager is going to look at it and go, oh, yeah, if our customers saw this, I think they would be interested. Then you're good. You know, don't worry. It's too simple. I, I, I think you're... You, I think some inventors think like, oh, an inventor is somebody like an engineer and they're creating these tremendously complex, really cool, wow inventions when some of it's just stupid simple. I mean, my business partner's book, our book is one simple idea. And there's a reason for that. So, um, I, Veronica, just go for it. You're good. Go for it. Don't worry about getting respect either. I right? just, just want to get the thing licensed, you know. Um, uh, let's see, Christopher, I have good, good night. I have, I have, uh, maybe English in your first language. Good night. Good night is like goodbye. Um, but yes, it is a good night. I have created a solution to a medical condition. I wish to do a PPA, then try to profit via licensing or sale to a large pharma company. Okay. How can I assess my creation's full worth? Um, this, this, this question we get often well, I want to value my patent. You know, it's whatever somebody will pay you for it. So, you know, how you can assess the worth is when you get interest from a company. So again, the, the three things, I always talk about this, is the royalty rate, the price of the product, and the volume being sold. So let's say it's a 5% royalty, the price is $30, and they're going to sell 200,000 units a year. You can do the math. So you have to figure out how much they can sell, at what price, at what royalty rate, and that's your value. And then you go, oh, well, maybe they could sell it for eight years, and you, you, you figure that out. So you can run those numbers, Christopher, if that gets you excited, you know, on that, on that volume. Um, you know, and by the way, the royalty rate is on the wholesale price. So that's the price they sell to the retailer for. So in pharma, that might work that way. But um, – uh, solution to a medical condition. Yeah, you know, you're dealing with FDA stuff and all that. That's going to be a harder product to work on, but you probably already know that. Um, okay. Uh, okay, Brandon says, I'm looking for a power bank manufacturer, but they're all Chinese. Some are produced in the U.S., but most are Chinese. If the product is is made in the U.S., does do they follow any of our patent laws? It doesn't matter where the product is made. It's where it's sold, Brandon. So it doesn't matter that these companies are Chinese. It, it, quite often with electronics products, you know, the, 
there's a US company, Canadian, European, and they're getting it made in China, but they're putting their name on it. And, and, and they're the brand, they're the company, and they're who you license to. Um, I don't know how many of them, you know, I don't know what you mean by power bank manufacturer. I need to understand that a little bit better. But um, I don't know if it's an industrial or consumer product. But for consumer products, uh, quite often it's 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 still a U.S. company, even though they're getting it made in China. They're not the Chinese company isn't selling direct to industry. But it, it, with industry, it's a little bit more common than with consumer, so it could be. But what were your what was your question here? If the product does does they do they follow our patent laws? So there's a theme here, guys. There's a theme. And this theme is I'm afraid of getting ripped off. And you got to knock that off. You got to, now how I said, I use the word stupid, I knock it off. I, gotta, I can't say that either. Um, but this is the truth. Most inventors rip themselves off, not companies. They rip themselves off out of their own fear. Because if you never show your product to anybody, you ripped yourself off. So, you know, I mean, do these, so if a Chinese company is selling power bank, power banks in the U.S., they have to abide by U.S. laws to answer your question. Yes, absolutely they do. I don't care if they're in China. So it's, it's where the product is sold, not where it's manufactured. A U.S. patent protects you in the U.S. A Canadian patent protects you in Canada. An Australian patent protects you in Australia. It's just that simple. It doesn't matter where the company resides. So now if you're saying, oh, well, they're going to kind of work around me, whatever, and then go ahead and sell it in the market by not abiding, they would, they would have to work around it, right, um, you know, in some way. So anyway, good, good questions, guys. But the, the fear is very clear. Um, okay. Uh, Will says, hi, Andrew. I had a vision of creating my product, doing a Kickstarter the whole nine yards after talking with my partner who has been in the industry for a long time. He thinks licensing is the path. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll give my Kickstarter talk. So Kickstarter is, is, oh, then he wrote, my issue with this is by going with licensing, I'll make a lot less money. See, let's address that. Because we have to split equity as well as the licensing agreement taking a portion. Okay, what should I do? Great, great question, Will. So, um, Kickstarter, I, I like the grassroots nature of Kickstarter, at least what it used to be, but it's just a mess now, guys. So the thought that you can go on this website, Kickstarter, and do a video and do your pitch for your product and raise money is really cool. It was really grassroots. Um, but these days, what it is, is you know, you, most people need to spend at least 20K just to promote on Kickstarter these days, unless you have a massive social network you know, you're just going to be lost in a sea of other people doing Kickstarter. Um, so it's not what it used to be there. Another thing is if, you're, if your campaign is successful, quite often there's somebody knocking you off on Amazon before you, you even get going. Whereas when you license to a big company, they push it out there hard and fast in a big way, and you're the first ones out there. So I've seen instances of people going on Kickstarter, and before their campaign's even done, somebody else is selling it on Amazon. Not kidding. So, and that is rampant. People are all over Kickstarter stealing ideas like you wouldn't believe. Um, now, but those aren't even the two biggest problems. The biggest problem is people fail miserably on Kickstarter to raise the money. That's the first problem. And then the second problem is when they raise the money, they fail to be able to manufacture it and deliver it because it's very hard to manufacture a product yourself when you don't have experience and deliver it. So like my... Our IT guy, James, he, he used to tell me, oh, I got this thing on Kickstarter. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then I check in with him like six months, a year, two years later. Did you get that? Oh, no, they haven't delivered it yet. And I'm like, how has it been? Two years? Are you kidding me? So they fail to raise the money because they don't know how to do a proper social media campaign. They fail um, to to deliver if they did raise enough money. And then when they, if they do deliver, it's like, what do you do now? Okay, so I delivered 5,000 units. Do you think Bed Bath & Beyond or Walmart's going to go, oh, my God, you sold 5,000 units? They could care less. So now you're still in that same place. You're one product, one SKU company with no distribution, and big retailers don't want to give you shelf space. You know, and, and then in order to do that, 
you barely got enough money just to fund those orders. Now you don't have enough money. You need God knows how much money to, to start your own business and sell to major retailers because there's large lag times between the cash flow going out and it coming back in, you know? So Stephen, our other co-founder, he's done nothing but license his whole career, but he's did these little guitar picks that were in the shape of uh, Mickey Mouse and skulls and different things. They sold more at 7-Elevens than at music stores. It was kind of a novelty. And they were lenticular too, where you change it and it changes the picture. He started that business, a couple of his friends, and they have plenty of money with 200K. This product cost six cents a piece to manufacture. They didn't have enough money with 200K once they started getting orders on a six cent product. It's crazy how much money it takes to start your own business. And then retailers don't like one skew one product companies. They just don't like you. Um, and if you work tooth and nail to get in there, they will kick you to the curb pretty quickly if you don't create a whole product line. Now it's not about your one product. Now you've got this whole business with manufactured with salespeople and other employees, and it's all about the business. It's not about the product so much. Of course, it's still about the product. But what I mean is you have to enjoy running a business. And so people don't look, Will, people don't look at where they're going with venturing and with Kickstarter because it won't get most people will fall flat on their face and even raising the money. And then when they raise the money, they'll fall flat on their face later. Very few people succeed. And because it's a sea of people on there now, and you got major companies on there promoting their product on there. And it's like, what's that? That's not grassroots. That's, that's not, that's no good. And there's a lot of that going on. So most people do have any mod mod moderate success. They need to pay, pay some media firm at least 20 K if not more to help them out with the publicity. So now let's address your question about um, earning less money. You know, so you sell 5,000 units on Kickstarter. You'd be lucky if you make any money on that. But then later you keep going. Well, first of all, you're back at ground zero unless you raise hunt, like tons and tons of money. And so, you know, if you didn't raise enough money, you're not going to be able to sell it. Um, so, and then if you do raise some money, what kind of volume are you talking? Are you talking 5,000 a year, 10,000 a year? Like, what are you doing? Where you license this big company. So let's say you have a 20% profit margin, okay? And you sell 5,000 units a year. Well, if you license it to a big company and they sell 100,000 units a year and you're getting a 5% royalty, you know, it's and you have no risk, that's a lot more attractive. Some companies, maybe they only have a 15%, 20% profit margin. They're giving you five. Let's say they're making 20% profit margin after all their costs. And they're getting 15, you're getting five, and they're taking all that risk. Seems pretty freaking fair to me. Um, so, you know, but, I, you know, it might be eight or 10% royalty or what have you. It might be them selling crazy volume, and it might be a 4% or a 3% royalty. 5% is the most common. But you've got this perception you're going to make less. So you might only make less per unit, but they're selling crazy volume. So the best thing you can do, in my opinion, Will, is to go with your business partner's advice and try to license it, see what deals you can get on the table. And you will analyze those deals and go, okay, on this deal, we're going to be earning 150K a year, 200K a year, whatever it is. And you're either okay with that or you're not. You could always go back and venture it if you wanted to. But really, if you're using the licensing business model, I would look at the product and go, well, geez, all these people are experts in the field and they see all these problems with it and they don't want to license it. It's getting no traction. Maybe we just work on licensing another product instead of mortgaging your house and home and spending two or three years of your life trying to sell it yourself. So, so I, you know, you asked me, what should I do? I'm not going to tell you what to do because it's what's right for you. There are some people that are wired up to run a company, but you need to have mad skills and people management skills and, and you need to be able to raise huge sums of money. And if that's your thing and you have a background in that or you have desire to do that and you can find people on the team to do what you can't, you don't know how to do, I'm not going to tell people not to start their own business. But, this, but if you're doing it just because you think you're going to earn less money. You're doing it for the wrong reasons because you might earn a hell of a lot more money with licensing. But it depends on what kind of deal you cut, right? Um, so let's see. We got about five minutes left. Let's see here. Chad says, good suggestions. 
Yes, for most of these questions, folks need to get the book One Simple Idea. So yeah, our, our book is called One Simple Idea. It's by Stephen Key, my business partner. If you just Google it or go on Amazon, yeah, you'll find it. And uh, I mean, I'm not promoting that to, you know, I'm promoting it because it was help you. I mean, I think we make five cents a book or something like that because we did, um, uh, you know, we don't, you don't make money on books. But um, so it is a great book. Um, and it was always available on audiobook too, but my understanding is we licensed, uh, we um, did a deal with a major publisher, never doing that again. All our other books are, are self-published, um, but that was a long time ago. So and I, it might be going out of audio, which really sucks because some of you really like to listen to audio version. Um, so you might get it while you can. I didn't even check recently if it's still available on audiobook. Rainflake, is there an, a way to auction an idea for licensing to multiple companies? Um, to me, the worth of my idea is the best offer I receive. No, I said I wouldn't use the word stupid again, but that's stupid. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. Well, you really, you think that a bunch of companies are gonna fight for your idea in an auction? Are you kidding me? No, no. I mean, what do you think marketing managers at companies have time to go to some auction, some patent auction, and we're going to buy, you know, th that might work for some super, um, for, for Silicon Valley tech technology stuff in some way, shape or form. But for the average product, Rainflake, that's, that's not, you got to get out of that mindset, man. You got to make the effort. You got to make a sell sheet, got to make a big list of companies, got to approach all those companies and you only need a license to one, you know, and that's what you got to do. Okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Brad, Brad uh, said, I listened, I listened to it over a dozen times before signing up. That's the one simple idea book. That's cool, Brad. Um, people say they binge watch our YouTube show a lot too. I talk to people all the time like, oh man, I feel like I know you, you know, I, I've been watching you on YouTube and my wife came in and she's like, what have you been doing the last three hours? And they, oh, I'm watching these InventRight guys. And I'm like, it's very flattering. I don't think I could listen to myself for an, for three hours. Um, so thank you guys for listening to me. Hopefully you like this stuff. It's hard to find the kind of information that we give. Um, it, it is, it is. Um, but we're proud that we provide it. Uh, so uh, Julie says, Hi, Andrew. Thank you for another full hour of Q&A. Looking for success stories. What is the most popular product InventRite help launch or the product that was most fun, fun launch? You know, I, that's a good question. You know, I've, I lose track of it. I, I, you know, when, when we have a student that licenses a product, the coach will send an email to everybody in the company saying my student licensed a product. And everybody's like, yeah. And it's like this email chain goes on for the entire day. It's really cool. Um, but I, I just, I don't, I don't really look back a lot. I don't, I haven't gone back and looked at all the success stories. We got them coming out all the time. Um, you know, and your, your question was, what is the most popular product? I don't know what you mean by popular. You know, we, we don't pry with students and go, how much did you earn? Oh, you're in a million dollars over five years. Oh, okay. We're going to make this giant check. And we're going to take a picture of you with this giant check. And we're going to say, you could be like this InventRight student. You know, we don't do crap like that because I, I think that's crap. It's, it's get rich quick crap. And, and um, I think that a, a lot of inventors fall for get rich quick. They don't use those types of approaches, but invention, scam, promotion companies, they don't want to steal your idea. They just want your money. Um, there's endless lists of these invention promotion companies. Oh, you don't have to do anything. We'll do it all for you. And they always ask you for 10 or 12 grand and nothing ever happens. Um, so I think that there's a ton of those companies and, and they are selling get rich quick and we, we aren't. So mo I don't know what the most popular product would be, um, you know, uh, or the product that was most fun at launch. Wow. You know, if I, I have to go back on, if you go to our testimonials page, there's a bunch of them on there. There's a lot that aren't on there too. I'd have to go back there. 
I'd really, I, I want to say that on the next live stream that I'll go look at, then I'll come back, but I'm probably going to forget to do it, to be honest with you, because I manage like 22 people. So, and I'm very busy, but that's a really good question. The most fun. I don't know. I need to think on that. I think it's a great question though. Um, you know, and you know what's reminding me of, I, I need to spend some time. I need to go back. I just like to look forward. I don't like to look back. And although I think looking back at that and just being proud of what we have done as a company and what our students have done, I should look at all those products. You know, I was kind of doing that a little bit today because we were looking for um, speakers for our series. And I was looking at all the companies that our students have licensed to. And so um, I, I'm doing that anyway. I just started doing that today, Julie. So I'm going to take a closer look at that. I'm going to see if I can come back and and share that story. I can't promise I'll do it on the next live stream, but share a story or two. I guess I, I didn't actively think about doing that because I'm not into doing a sales pitch and saying, you know, buy our program or buy an, and, and if I just listed an endless list of success stories, but I will try to pick which one was uh, pick a couple to talk about. I think that's a great thing. Sorry to ramble on that guys. Um, Retro says he has the audio book too. Yeah, get it while it's still there. That's not a sales pitch, guys. I just, I hear that McGraw-Hill is going to cut because they're in a fight with Amazon or something. Um, they're going to cut our audio book so you can only get it written. Um, our book is in a lot of languages, one simple idea. It's in Portuguese, but it's not in freaking Spanish. I'm like, what the hell's going on with that? And it's in a ton of other languages too. Um, so... Let's see, what was it? Oh, 612, I think I gotta wrap it up. I got something I promised my wife I would do. So I better help her out there. So um, Blue Raspberries, thanks again so much for doing this. Um, uh, Brad says, know that listening to you um, banter and rapid fire stories, truth, tr truths is informative and entertaining uh, in my opinion. Thank you, Brad, that's nice. Um, Let's see. Uh, Veronica says, so glad to have found you guys. Thanks again. Thank you, Veronica. Um, Philip says, uh, also, this is the biggest live chat yet. Uh, no, I don't think so. Th thank you, Philip. Yeah, we hit 40,000 subscribers on our YouTube. For a while there, we were hitting over 100 people, which is really cool. But, um, you know, we barely promote these, and we're, we're at 70 right now, and I think we're a little bit higher before and we barely promote them so it's what if we really promoted it that would be cool um rick says thank you for the feedback it's inspirational you're welcome rick um clyde good info rainflake thank you marlon thank you for doing this and so sorry if i didn't answer all of your questions guys i couldn't get to them all um but uh i i really enjoyed it um and again i, I like to say this you know take in the fact that Inventing, coming up with ideas is part of who you are, probably. I can't say for all of you. Um, it's really important. So take the time to invest in yourself, invest in your education, invest in getting real life experience by reaching out to companies. And you can do it. Anybody can do this. Um, like tomorrow night, we're going to have Jason on. Is it Jason? No. Just Jason. Yeah. Jason on. I was trying to remember. Justin. No. Oh. God, now I remember his name. We're having the president of Fred and Friends on tomorrow. And if you look at his, his uh, uh, functional novelty products, anybody could invent this stuff. You know, you could look at these things and anybody can invent stuff that could be his next product. And I know some of you are inventing highly technical things, but you guys can do this. Whether you're non-technical, super technical, you know, you don't have to be super creative either. Just a little creative and not don't judge yourselves when you're creative. And, um, but then hunker down, do the business side of things, keep being creative. None of the stuff we're going to teach you as much fun as coming up with ideas, accept it and just do the work and you'll be, guys will be great. So thank you guys. T take care and uh, keep inventing and we'll catch you the next time. See you guys. Bye.